and I'll share my screen and we can get started. So today we're doing the microplastic screening. Um, we'll be talking about a new program that we're going to be rolling in through the new year um, and hopefully continue this for the next year. Um, so again, there's Anna, who is our watershed outreach coordinator for Mountain True, Grace Fuchs, who's an AmeriCorps member, and myself, Hannah, um, who's an AmeriCorps member working in with the Watauga River Keeper. So to start us off, Grace will give us a little background. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about plastic pollution and the scale of the problem. Um, so you can have context for the work that Mountain True is going to do here in our mountain region. Um, this is a map of the five large ocean gyres of plastic. And so this is places where the ocean currents tend to deposit plastic and they all stick together um, and form large clumps. Um, they're quite massive and this only really counts for surface plastic and it's suspected that up to 90% of the ocean plastic, plastic in the ocean is already at the bottom of the ocean. So this is a really big problem. Um, next. This statistic I think is pretty profound that in four years, uh, for every three pounds of fish biomass that there are in the ocean, uh, there will be one pound of plastic. And by 2050, this statistic is supposed to flip, where there will be three pounds of plastic for every pound of fish in the ocean, um, which is really quite alarming. Um, next. Uh, plastics are such a ubiquitous problem that we have microplastic pieces in our bodies already. Um, the majority of bottled and tap water is contaminated with microplastics because our wastewater treatment plants aren't able to uh, extract the plastic pieces out of the water. Um, microfibers from synthetic clothing can also just uh, you know, pull off and be in the ambient air that we breathe. And a new study recently found that microplastics are being incorporated into babies as they develop. So this problem is not only all over the world, but it's also in our bodies. And we don't really know a lot about the health impacts yet. Um, plastics are known to be endocrine disruptors and alter the hormone pathways in our body, but a lot of the impacts are still really unstudied. Um, Next. So I have a couple of graphics just to showcase how much plastic we accidentally consume. Um, about every week through uh, the air and water and our food, we consume about a credit card's worth of plastic. And next. So over the course of a year, we end up eating basically a heaping plate's worth of plastic, which again is really, really alarming. Next. So one of the first places that identified um, microplastics was wastewater treatment plants, but more studies have found that 300 more times, 300, uh, you know, percent more of our plastic actually enters our waterway through storm drains and stormwater runoff. Um, pictured here, obviously you can see the uh, storm drains acting as a filter for both uh, biological material, but as well as litter. Um, next. So one of the things a mountain true does to combat this is obviously um, to get people in the river and in waterways to clean things up. Um, we have Anna pictured here with a canoe full of trash and we have a um, 
volunteer event. A river cleanup is something we tend to do frequently in our watersheds um, to get plastic and other materials and trash out. Obviously, we're doing that um, as we can when it's safe. A person can spend their entire life picking trash up out of the river and still not get it all. So we're also looking for some new um, innovations. Next. So there's um, been an invention of some passive filtration machines. Um, the bigger picture here is a trash trout, which was built by Asheville Greenworks. They have several around in the Asheville area. And basically they have a cage that collects all the surface material, whether that's uh, wood or water <laughs> or trash but it allows the water and animal life to pass through and periodically volunteers will go out and clean this gate um, to take out all the trash and obviously let the rest of the woody debris through. And then um, the smaller photo on the right is another example of this. Uh, Baltimore has Mr. Garbage Wheel. I think it's very funny that they've like anthropomorphized, you know, the trash wheel eating all the trash as it filters everything out. Um, and so there's been a real big push to have this sort of system in place um, because obviously like people can't get all the plastic out ourselves. Uh, next. So plastic is really also a climate change issue as we've seen a push and a shift towards renewable energy um, for our electricity production. You've also seen oil and natural gas companies turn more towards pl plastic production as a way to use the fuels they extract. So for instance, here we have an ethane cracker plant, which turns natural gas commonly uh, extracted by fracking, which has its own set of environmental problems. Um, this process turns uh, the natural gas into a usable plastic derivative. And so, Currently, 70% uh, of our plastics that we make end up either in the landfill or in the ocean. And by 2050, that number, the number of plastics that we use is expected to triple. Um, currently, about 6% of our carbon budget goes towards plastic production. And by 2050, that's gonna jump to 15% with that increase in plastic use. Um, the carbon budget is calculated annually as the amount of CO2 we can release into the air while avoiding uh, the threshold of two degrees uh, average global temperature increase. And so plastics, the pl plastic problem is not going to go away um, because it's persistent and we're also increasing our use. Next. This graphic is just going over the basics of how the extracted natural gas gets diverted into plastics. Um, and this is a very energy intensive process to extract the natural gas and go through all this industrial um, processing in order to get it to be a usable material. Um, so that in and of itself also really contributes to climate change. Next. This is a map um, showing the distribution of studies that have been done on microplastics. This is still a fairly new field. At the top there, it says there's been around a thousand publications. And most of this, as you can see, has been in the ocean where plastics kind of end up. Next. So if you zoom in on the US or any other country in this map, you'll see again that most of the studies have been done along the coastline, um, excluding the Great Lakes, those are fresh water, but those kind of act as an ocean in the sense that they're also an endpoint for where plastics end up. Um, but since we know plastics are a big problem in our bodies, 
And certainly all the plastic that ends up in the ocean has to come from somewhere. Um, it really surprised me that there hasn't been more freshwater studies. So what we're hoping to do here at Mountain True is start um, sampling for microplastics essentially in the headwaters of our aquatic ecosystems to see you know, what microplastics are here. Obviously we don't get all of the trash you know, in our rivers between here and the ocean, but there's probably still going to be microplastics in our waters and it's important for us to know how much is there. Next, I think I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. Um, that was a great introduction to, you know, why we're doing this and why it's important. Um, so to give you a brief intro introduction to microplastics and what they are. So they're not a certain type of plastic. They're actually fragments of original um, pieces. So um, a plastic bot water bottle you use three days ago ends up on the side of the road. The sun hits it, sun hits it it becomes brittle and breaks apart um, and eventually run, runs off into the river. Um, so these are actually defined as parts smaller than five millimeters. Um, so you'll definitely need a microscope to view them. And according to the EPA, it's considered, plastics are considered an emerging contaminant. Um, and one of the largest contributors of microplastics to freshwater our wastewater treatment plants, but they're certainly not the only source. So um, a lot of these small particles can, can avoid being filtered out through our, um, our normal processing of waste and um, end up in the river through effluents. And so some of the main ways that the microplastics are, are categorized are fibers, fragments, films, and microbeads. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the microbeads um, on the next slide, but here you can tell these are little microbeads here. Um, this is actually a piece of burnt plastic, so it could be from a, a melting plastic bag. Um, and here is an example of a plastic thread. And so these are what these particles or like these particles look like underneath the microscope. Um, and this is a Canadian coin. So it's just giving you that, that size reference. And um, microfibers often come from clothing. Um, that's another way that they can end up in our, in our waterways is through washing synthetic clothing um, actually made of plastics. So now that we know what microplastics are, um, we'll talk a little bit about the structure of the program that we're putting in place. So um, obviously most of you are joining because you're interested in having some sort of role in solving this problem. So um, what we would like for our volunteers to do is participate in the online training. So great first step. Um, and then we'll, we'll have, we obviously have these three different regions. Um, Grace is in Hendersonville, Anna's in Asheville area, and I'm in the Boone area. Um, so we will coordinate with our teams, um, pick up and drop off systems. So we'll, we'll get to know you personally. Um, we have a few sites picked out that we would love to have volunteers go take water samples monthly. And then um, while taking your samples, you can document the amount of like large plastics you can see. And so we'll have reference of the microplastics after we run your water sample in the lab. And then we'll also have this um, you know, larger in-person plastics data to reference it by. Um, and then we would love for you to send photos while you're out there of yourself or um, just how much trash is out there and how it changes um, throughout, the, throughout the year. And our role is just going to be working with our volunteers monthly, making sure that you know, we're coordinating correctly, that you have all the supplies you need, um, that you know how to take the water samples. And then once we drop, once you drop them off, we'll collect them and we sample the, all of the samples, or we process all of the samples in, in our labs. Um, and I'll go into that process a little later. Um, and then we'll record these macro and micro numbers on an Excel spreadsheet and hopefully be able to um, generate a report um, and we are an advocacy organization, so hopefully um, we'll be able to use this information to spark some change. 
So um, many of you are probably like, well, how do I take a microplastic sample? Um, it's actually super easy. Um, we just ha we'll have plastic, well, we won't have plastic jars. Um, she does, this picture is um, from Florida, their Florida, the Florida um, testing program, but we will have glass jars and um, we just want you to dip, keep the lid on, dip the, um, the jar in the water and slowly tilt it upright um, to, to make sure that it fills with water without air bubbles. And one of the main things that you wanna make sure you, that doesn't happen is um, if it's super muddy or if it's really dirty where you're, you're, you are, um, the more sediment that's in there, the harder it is to process the sample. So um, just try and get it a clear area where there isn't a bunch of debris. Um, but that's pretty much all there is to it. So, um, so then once you take these uh, samples back to the lab, there's really no, um, they don't expire, they don't go bad. Um, once we have the water sample with the plastic in there, it's pretty much can um, sit on our shelf for, uh, forever, but we hope to keep up with uh, processing so that we keep all of our data current. Um, so uh, when we get back to the lab, we have a setup very similar to this lady who um, is part of the Florida Microplastics Program. Um, it's called the Microplastics Awareness Project, and um, it's actually a photo from 2015. So they, being um, Oceanside, they were, you know, some of the first people to um, develop this and implement it. Um, so we were kind of modeling our our program after after them, and it was a project in tandem with NOAA and uh, the Sea Grant. So we have this flask, a vacuum filtration flask, and we'll process a liter of our water um, in the top. It'll drain through on a piece of paper with grid lines. Um, and then after that, we'll let it dry and most of the organic materials will shrivel up and then the plastics will stay, um, will keep their shape and size. And so when we look at these underneath the microscope, um, we'll just go row by row systematically um, and record the number of fibers, fragments, microbeads that we find um, in, our, in our samples. And one of the things I forgot to mention on the last slide is your role as a volunteer, the most important thing um, is just to have the, the samples um, have the site name, date and time, and yeah, just labeled so that we know when and where this was taken and maybe even by who so we can, you know, cross cross reference things. So um, that's, a, that's a really important piece of information <laughs> I, I remembered from the labels here. Um, so, let's see. So to give you a little bit more information about microbeads, um, this this up here is against a ten cent coin. Um, this is just showing you the pure size and like that uh, you know they really are micro. Um, and you might recognize microbeads from facial scrubs or anything that says, "Oh, this exfoliates." Um, and they've actually been phased out starting in 2015 when the Microbead Free Waters Act was put in place. Um, and that banned plastic microbeads in cosmetics and personal care products. Um, but it doesn't mean they don't exist anymore. <laughs> um, and microbeads are actually formed from polyethylene plastic, which is a byproduct of the, um, the fracking and the hydrocarbon extraction. Um, and so microbeads started first appearing about 50 years ago, and it was replacing natural ingredients like oatmeal or sugar um, in, cosmetic, in, in cosmetic products. And then here we see a fiber, um, which could be from a piece of clothing, like I mentioned before. Um, so in this Florida Microplastics Awareness Project, they found that there was an average of eight pieces of microplastics found per liter of water. Um, and seven out of the eight of those were identified as plastic fibers. So that's showing that the clothing industry um, and you know what we wear is really important as far as um, reducing the amount of microplastics that we are emitting into our waterways. So now we'll talk a little bit more about the macroplastics that we'll be doing in tandem with the microplastics program. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so a lot of y'all 
worked with me on this last year. We did it as kind of like a pilot project um, before we started this bigger plastics campaign. Uh, so y'all are already familiar with this, but for folks who are not, um, it's, it's fairly simple. And the reason we measure these macroplastics, one, uh, it's because it's pretty dramatic. Um, the last few years, we've just been seeing more and more trash in the waterways, regardless of however number of river cleanups we do. So, um, and more and more and more of that is, is plastic. And like Hannah and Grace, I've said, plastic doesn't degrade. It doesn't it doesn't go anywhere. It just, it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces until we can't see it anymore, until we have those nano pieces that we can only see with microscopes and we're starting to ingest it. It's getting into fish, it's getting into um, every facet of the environment. Uh, I, I was on a webinar a couple of weeks ago and they, were, they found microplastics in sediments that were like hundreds of miles in remote wilderness. So it's it's everywhere and it's it's a growing issue and it's being driven by the fossil fuel industry. Um, so in order, what Mountain Tree wants to do um, is to really be on the forefront of this fight in order to change the narrative. We, we Plastics are convenient. They're very convenient. They're strong and durable when they need to be. They're flexible when they need to be, um, but there's alternatives and there's there's what plastics do to the environment is um, it's it's ravaging the environment. So this program is is dealing with is trying to deal with that in a few different ways. And in microplastics is um, is one way we're starting to study that, like Hannah mentioned. And then this macroplastic stuff, it's dramatic. It, you can see it with your eyes. Um, and uh, it helps us kind of quantify what we might see in the microplastic part of the design. So, you know, we're seeing tons of plastic bags these days. Um, if we see a ton of, of plastic bags on this macro side, we're, we're gonna expect that that's what we're gonna see uh, in the microscope when we look at it later. So um, this part of the program is very easy. Uh, we, yeah will go out, volunteers that are interested can go out once a week. That's really all I ask. And you can go out for 10 to 20 minutes to any site anywhere and pick up trash for 10 or 20 minutes just with your hands. I usually just like put it in a, a like Lowe's five gallon bucket or something. Um, and once you're done picking up trash, you just take kind of like a general audit, like how many bags were there? How many plastic bottles were there? And you'll fill out this form that I'll send you, which Maybe I linked it. Yeah, let's see if it goes. Oh wait, Hannah, can you click that? See, um, this is kind of what it looks like. It's super general. Um, if there's anything that isn't covered in the form, you can always add it as a note or an email to one of us. But it really just is kind of capturing what you saw that day, where you were, and. Um, and just kind of giving us a picture of what you found. So, so that's it. After you do that, if you have a social media presence, we request that you post your pictures. And the point of that is to just kind of do a rallying call. We, we want this to influence your social circles to make personal and uh, personal changes. You know, like you go to the supermarket, maybe you can buy something that's wrapped in plastic, but there's something, the same thing in this version that's not wrapped in plastic. So like just get people starting to talk and think about it. That's really the point of this part of the program. Um, and then also you're always, and we encourage this too, we would love you to email us your photos because then we can use it on our end to push to the Mountain True Riverkeeper world of folks too. Um, and we keep up with that data pretty well. Last Last year during our pilot project, I think we just six weeks worth and we collected over 1400 pieces of plastic. So it was like pretty eye opening how much is out there. Um, all right, Hannah, can I go? Yeah, cool. So um, at the same time that we're doing this microplastic study, macroplastic study, we're gonna be working behind the scenes 
with local legislators. I don't know if y'all can hear that background noise. <laughs> Sorry if you can. Um, we're we're gonna be working with county and city officials across water across the watersheds that we work in to really push for a bag ban. Discuss a bag ban. Discuss things that can go along with that bottle bills, stuff like that on those levels. Um, sorry, can y'all hear that? <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so we're gonna be doing that within the Mountain True world. There's some other river keepers across North Carolina that are also gonna be working with their state official, or with, sorry, with their local officials to discuss similar bans or bag bans, bag fees, things like that. Um, and we're hoping that if we can get like all these little pockets in the state to push for these types of things, maybe we can we can like rally towards the state to get an actual state ban on bags. That's the that's the the hope. Um, at the same time, there's some things you can be doing to help push some things forward at the federal level. Uh, an act was introduced um, last year, but it never got to the floor. It's called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, um, and it's going to be reintroduced again in February. So now that um, it has a chance to get brought to the floor, which is pretty exciting, once it does, we encourage everybody to reach out to their representatives and senators to ask for this. Let's get this thing passed. It, it encompasses a lot of things, a lot of big changes to the way plastics, the plastic world works. It adds um, it calls per, for producer responsibility. Um, it, it says we can't just export our plastic waste to developing countries. Um, and uh, it, it has a whole slew of things in there that are really good um, for the long term in reducing our dependency on some of these plastics. The other thing which tomorrow will be pushed out pretty wide is it's called it's calling for a plastic-free president. And tomorrow, um, hold on, let me go back. So plastic-free president is basically a coalition of about 600 organizations that have signed on to ask Biden to prove to be a take on the plastics issue. Uh, so tomorrow we'll be sending out petitions and you can sign it today. Hannah, if you wanna click on that. Um, we'll be, we'll be sending this out and you can sign it. And really it's asking the president to do eight executive actions to tackle the plastic problem. Um, yeah, this, oh, I don't know. Can y'all see that? Whether or not you can see it, you can go to this website and sign sign up. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> sign it and just ask, ask the Biden administration plastics. The plastic issue is a climate change issue and we need to take hard, fast steps to really curb its impact on the environment. Um, I think that's it for this slide. Yeah, I think uh, that's, that's everything that we had um, for right now. These are some outside sources. Um, Anna mentioned a, a webinar that we recently went to. Um, it featured Judith Ent, I, I can't say her last name, but Enk. Um, she was wonderful and gave us um, tons of resources on how to, um, you know, make change and spark change. So um, these are some resources that if you're interested in learning more, um, they can explain the issue a lot better than we can um, as far as the whole scope of every, you know, all the intricacies. So there's Plastic Wars on PBS and that's free and available to stream. Um, Beyond Plastics is a um, nonprofit organization that's led by Judith, um, who was the former regional EPA administrator um, under Obama. So um, a lot of knowledge there, and um, they're one of the main the main pushers of the Break Free from Plastic um, bill that's going to Congress. Um, Our Stolen Future, which is a book by Pete Myers, it's old but it's still um, pretty relevant to, you know, the world that we are in now. Um, and then um, if you're interested and you listen to us and you just wanna learn more, um, The Story of Plastic is a free streaming um, documentary 
and there's Water Keepers of Chesapeake and Potomac River Keeper Network that will be posting or hosting a free virtual film screening and uh, panel discussion. So um, that's happening on Thursday, January 21st, um, where they'll be having a discussion about the video on Zoom. Um, but if you wanted to just check out the documentary, um, it's available through them. Um, and I can try and post this link in the chat as well um, when we get towards the end. Um, but those are just some of the resources and some of the top um, researchers right now. And uh, this is Chelsea Rockman, which it's R-O-C-H-M-A-N. And um, Dr. Sherry Mason, they're some of the top leaders in the research that's going on right now um, surrounding microplastics. So here's our, um, our information. Uh, Anna, again, in the central region, Asheville area. Um, I'm in the high country, which is Boone, Watauga area. And then Grace will be in the southern region, which is Hendersonville area and Green River area. So um, feel free to jot down our emails and our contact information. Um, we'll be happy to work with you. And um, we'll be putting out a form too. Uh, that way we can kind of separate who's who um, because we wanted to include everybody and you know, have one video where or one um, webinar where we work together on, um, but we definitely want to know where where you are in the state and um, who who you can best help with this program. And so, with that, um, if y'all don't have anything else to add for right now, um, we'll go ahead and take some questions. Um, I just want to say that I shared the uh, Google form if you're interested in volunteering with us. That's just like, hey, I'm interested in volunteering in Boone or Asheville or Hendersonville. And then um, that can also be another way for us to like facilitate contacting you about that. Yeah, so I think our general idea was we after this was over we would send an email out to everybody who was here and who couldn't come um they would fill out this form and then we'll it contact you individually about setting up your microplastic sampling site with materials and then the macroplastic stuff so um you'll be hearing from us maybe a couple more times as we kind of filter everybody out to where they need to go Perfect. Um, so we did have one question. Uh, can we bring other people in our social circles who have not received training um, or forward the recording onto those who might be interested but couldn't be here today? And absolutely, um, we'll send out the recording to you and you're welcome to share it with um, whoever you think might be interested or people who um, aren't, but you think it's just good information. Um, and of course, you don't need training to be able to take a water sample or pick up trash, but I think it does help um, a lot just to have background knowledge on what you're doing and why it's important and how you're really um, playing an important role within Mountain True, but also, you know, within the community. So we're seeing some folks having trouble with permissions to, for the Google form. So we'll work on that uh, and, and hopefully get that figured out so that everybody has access to it. Thank y'all for letting us know. I think the link I just resent um, should hopefully work, should be available to other people where you can take the survey and not necessarily edit the survey. Um, okay, so we have a question. When will both types of sampling begin? Um, so we're actually hoping to start um, within the end of January. So we would like our sampling to start next week um, and have that roll out. So the goal is to have 12 months of data by the end of the year. Um, so we're really excited for that. So um, there's no strict day that you would have to do it. Um, we would just need to coordinate, like pick up and drop off for the sampling materials. Um, so you could go out on Tuesday if you have a break, or you could go out on Saturday 
Um, we just kind of want it to be in that same week window across across um, across the regions. And it looks like that second link worked um, worked for people in the chat. Perfect. Um, I think we said this a few times at the beginning, but this presentation was recorded and will be uploaded to our uh, Mountain True YouTube page. And once that's done, we'll send a link to all the um, people that registered. So obviously, I know it's the middle of the workday. Not everyone could be here that wanted to be. But um, you can definitely go back and review this later. Any, any final questions? Um, so if you missed the first part, um, we will provide the bottles for sampling, um, but we will have to coordinate with the when, where, um, with our different regions. I'm in Boone, um, we've got Hendersonville and uh, Asheville area. So um, there's a link in the chat. Um, we can go ahead and uh, repost that. So it's first, first thing, but um, it'll send you to a Google form that you can fill out your contact information um, so we know where you are in the Western North Carolina area so we can um, get, you, get in touch with you and coordinate the specifics of where and when. Oh, perfect question. Um, is a slideshow going to be sent out as well? Um, I can send out the slideshow um, or in, and I can also uh, in that email that we follow up with you all um, in Google Forms, I can go ahead and include those resources um, at the bottom of that email. Um, I, I will say the story of plastics I've watched before and it's really moving. Um, you're ready to have your tissues, but it's good. It, it sparks change. So um, that's what we we're trying to do. So thank you all for being so interested and willing to help. Um, we really appreciate it. Well, you're always free to email us with questions or comments, concerns uh, in the meantime but we appreciate you all being here. Um, oh, we just got a, a big question. Let's see, it says, do you think that the president will take into account the magnitude of the problem by microplastics and be able to establish public policies? I certainly hope so. He seems to be pretty serious about climate change. So, um, you know, plastics is part of that, and, and we hope to see sustainable, long-lasting change from his end, or, and we'll be pushing for that as well. So um, keep your eyes open. We'll, we'll likely have action alerts and petitions. You can sign. You can start tomorrow by signing that petition we talked about. So feel free to go there, plasticfreepresident.org. All right. And um, if there aren't any further questions, we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up. Um, but we really appreciate all of you being here. Uh, thanks for your time today. Yeah, thanks for all your support. We'll be reaching out to everybody shortly, hopefully getting this thing on the road pretty soon. All right, I didn't stop recording.